Hello and welcome to the Cube Pod, episode forty-one. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, weekly podcast where we extract the signal from the noise. This week, uh, it's getting into the holidays. Dave, Christmas right around the corner. Friday, um, kind of a busy week, kind of clearing the decks. A lot of a lot of work to do, preparing for the end of the year and uh, getting ready for twenty twenty-four. Um, great to see you. Good to see you, John. Merry Christmas. Yeah, same to you. And uh, happy holidays, everyone listening. Hope everyone has a good holiday. It was supposed to snow in Tahoe, but we got a little rainstorm here, as they say. It came from the south, so it didn't get a little warm, warm, uh, warm rain. So didn't get the snow in Tahoe. So the Bay Area, Silicon Angle, Silicon Valley people are uh, uh, going to be uh, bummed. It's not much no snow. skiing. Huh, well, wow. there'll be there'll be some snow up there, but it's not a it's only two foot base, so um, still not bad. We can play. No, that's not bad. no ice. It's not not like Mad River Glen when you got all ice, you know, going down in Vermont. You can't um, ski a Mad River unless it dumps. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, um, obviously, a lot of stuff to talk about in terms of end of the year. Not a lot of big news here, but I mean, I think the big story I'm seeing is a lot of deals um, that across the spectrum. Obviously, the market is tight. We're going to get into analysis here around the S&P, S&P 500 stock performance all time, where that is hitting compared to the tech stocks. I'm sure you're going to have a good analysis on that. A lot of deals, M&A deals. Uh, companies going private, funding deals, some good funding deals around AI, obviously, and then the walking dead, a lot of companies, and a lot of VCs publicly coming out, Dave, and pretty being doom and gloom around what's happening around the startup scene. You know, as we said on the pod many episodes ago, the startups will be falling out of the sky. Um, it's the dead walking dead right now. That's kind of happening. Uh, also, big news this week, Apple has stopped selling Apple Watch Series 9 and the Ultra 2. Uh, and days before, because of the ban going into effect of the of, of again litigation and and the travel ban, the travel import ban, I should say, not the travel ban, the import ban goes into effect. Huge issue that's been dominating the news, and of course, the year in review, Dave, is the prediction time. All the everyone's pontificating on their predictions, uh, even from the analysts, um, and then you know pretend analysts as well. Uh, VCs are weighing in. It's always fun and to see analysts. what they what they what they do. <laughs> <laughs> the fake analysts, um, uh, the real analysts and the fake analysts are all pr- uh, putting their predictions. And people always have hot takes. I mean, t- Twitter X is turning into quite the, the the platform. Threads is where all the, quote, the cool people seem to be. Um, all the hot takes are on Twitter. We had a lot of stuff being discussed. It's it's, it's really awesome, actually, some of the predictions. Um, obviously, the ones we, we made years ago and continue to happen in the day around data and cloud. Um, Anthropic just got a $15 billion valuation in a reported kind of funding process they're going through. So they're in progress right now to raise a bunch of money at a $15 billion valuation. Day. Remember, Anthropic, that's the company that headlined in AWS. And of course, Mobile World Congress is coming up. We've been preparing for that. Looks like the Cube is going to have a massive set at Mobile World Congress now called MWC. Um, we're not going to be at uh, CES this year. We'll be there remote covering from the studio as well as some folks on the ground there. So uh, MWC is our next big show. Uh, and then finally, a section I want to put out there because it came back up again, Dave. Cloud repatriation done right. Um, Patrick Thornhill, a, a LinkedIn friend, commented on DH post, DHH's post. He's the Basecamp CTO and co-founder around looking back at the money they're saving. So obviously he bought 6,000 Dell servers. And of course, Patrick works for Dell. So interesting comment. I want to get your thoughts on that. So Good lineup tonight, and of course, the rant section is up for as, a, as a mixed bag, and um, maybe we could bring in some memes, meme, 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 meme me up, some memes, and there's some good commentary going around the internet this time of year. So, um, with, I'm looking at my uh, t- my 2023 predictions. Every year, I go back and I publish on how I did. I did okay. I, I don't. I don't think I did great though. I said tech spending increases four to five percent. That was wrong. Cost optimization, big theme. That was right. Security. I said. I said Cisco was going to buy. They did. Obviously, big twenty-eight billion dollar acquisition. Zero trust gets real. That's true. Gen AI hits where Metaverse missed. That was right. Yeah. Cloud expands to super cloud as edge computing accelerates. Cloudflare wins. Uh, mm-hmm. That's not bad. Blo- well, I mean, they were is, winning. They're continuing to win. Yep. And they're not hurting. Here's a miss. Blockchain struggles to find enterprise home. That's true. But devs will adopt in 2023 and Solidity wins. Eh, I don't think so. Yeah, AWS, was a, Databricks, Google. That was, that was, a, pra- that was a prayer. Charge. That was a prayer, actually. Right, it was a Hail Mary. Hey, yeah. look, I don't just. No, that was that was your optimism. You were just hoping for that to happen. I said automation makes a resurgence. UI path and power automate separate from the pack. That's true, but they really didn't win because of Gen AI. Kind of messed them up a little bit. Number of physical events doubles. Big events get small. Digital becomes a first-class citizen. I think that's true. So not bad. 
Yeah. I'll, have to, I'll have to do my grading. I don't know. I mean, I'd I think say, we, I think we success, I think I think we successfully predicted super cloud um, next generation impact of multiple clouds. I think we also predicted yep. uh, the generative AI wave. Um, again, we under predicted that that over that came in heavier than we thought. Um, and what I think yep. the big miss for me, this last prediction of pretty much we got it all right. My big miss was not so much blockchain as I didn't see the AI agents agent side of it coming. I thought the chatbot market was just a crappy market. I didn't think that there was more headroom on the quote chat bots. Remember the enterprise chat bots? Yeah, really? that's hot. I think I just saw ETR data. That was like the number one use of, of AI. I mean, it's exploding. So, so I, that's a miss, but I think that's more of a miss on the fact that I, didn't, I just didn't see the app yet. Um, and, and given the chat GPT focus, it was just more of like more, I, I went more into the data platform, but we, what we did get right, I will say this came up on Sanjeev Mohan's um, uh, predictions. Uh, he posted that uh, on his blog. Um, he's a, a pr 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 prominent uh, analyst in the data space. We predicted the intelligent data platform. Um, that was something yeah. that we picked big. We also predicted that the data would be upside down, flipping the script on how data is organized horizontally and vertically. Um, that was a huge prediction. I mean, I think that was probably the most successful original prediction we had last year. And obviously at reInvent, if you remember, we were on the whole next gen cloud prediction uh, from last year. That actually was happening. So if you look at next gen cloud, Dave, think about it. All this GPU cloud stuff, that's what we we're talking about. So I think yep. that was something that uh, uh, emerged. Not as obvious as we had thought, but it did get clarity on that. That next-gen cloud became like the MongoDB. Look at Mongo's success. Look at their stock, what they're doing. Okay, Mongo, Snowflake, Databricks. We predicted they would rise. They did. You see the new Magic Quadrant that came out? I did. I tweeted I think... it and shared it with you this morning, actually. Yeah, um, that's right. That's where I saw it. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> Mongo looks really good. Databricks, I, I got to go compare with last year. It looks like Databricks ticked up a little bit. Snowflake, maybe they're a leader, but sort of, you know, they're fighting, you know, neck and neck. Oracle's in there. Yeah. We had a deep dive the other day with the head of Oracle um, uh, in engineering for uh, Golden Gate, which is kind of like their open integration platform. Mm -hmm. I said open, but their integration platform. I was really impressed. So they saw the work that we did with uh, the six data platform. And they pinged us and like, we got to show you what we're doing. I got to tell you, I was impressed. I'm going to have, I'm going to have one of the guys on breaking analysis. It was that good, it was super technical and, you know, it was great. So that was interesting. I just got to do one more thing. So I get a big stack of predictions every year because I've been doing this for like a decade. And so all the PR people send me predictions and say, you know, basically, please use our predictions. And I, I, I can't use them all, but so I pull a couple out. The one here... I just want to share with you, this guy, Scott Stevenson from Deepgram, his prediction was AI is recession-proof in 2023. He got that one right. <laughs> oh, nailed that one, Scotty. Well, I mean, look, at I mean, it's going to be a fun year because 2024, it's going to be very interesting because what I want to talk to you about in this podcast is the, I want to weave in some financial analysis. I know we tend to talk about stock prices and um, and stuff, but it, it, is, it is an indicator. Um, and we can jump into it now and get into some of the predictions if you want. But um, last night I was checking out the S&P 500 all time. Right. And we were speculating on on this market because, you know, the prediction was is that 2024 is going to be a, um, a comeback. And if you look at the tech stocks and S&P 500 all, all time, it's the graph looks just like it's a steep curve. I mean, you go back to 2009 and, and even go back to 2019, it's a massive step up and all the tech stocks map the similar trajectory. Uh, it's interesting. Apple was the best bet of the tech stocks. Amazon is still at an all high, but they had that big drop. Apple didn't really drop as much. Meta had a killer drop, but they're back up to an all time high again, pushing that number up. So you got Amazon, Apple, Meta, uh, and Alphabet all at, with the same kind of graph. I mean, Berkshire Hathaway and JP Morgan, again, similar graphs. I bring them in there because they're not just tech. They're a good bounce, bounce uh, alternative to bounce around with. So you say, okay, tech stocks are doing great. They're matching the S&P 500, but also Berkshire Hathaway and JP Morgan stocks are this all-time high. So if you're an investor in the S&P 500, you're doing great. I think that to me is a bellwether. And the question, if you go back 10 years on these graphs, 
Okay. Go to Google, type in the S&P 500 and check the tech stocks. I just mentioned Amazon, Apple, Meta, and Alphabet, which is Google, and then compare Her back Berkshire Hathaway and, and um, JP Morgan, which is a bank stock, and then a diversified fund. You see kind of a big picture. The question, Dave, for 2024 is we could have a financial meltdown, right? I mean, the growth of, of, the, of the value in the past 10 years, and then even go back five years, it's really incredible. So the question that's all coming in these doom and gloom predictions is there's a lot of signaling from VCs coming in saying it's going to be a horrible year. I'll tell you one right now. Jonathan Hellinger, general partner at Vertex Venture, says a lot of companies are going to die. Direct. That's that's his statement. Okay. So big time macro environment tightening. That's going to be there. All the hurdles for business problems are done. So the people who are spending and not having a sustainable revenue model right now are going to be in a lot of trouble, according to him. Insuk Ray so, uh, weighed in and said, he, big, say? he says, Insuk Ray is the general manager, great partner uh, there and a friend of the cube. Bigger and better cyber attacks are coming. Okay. And he's really specifically talking about AI now driving better attacks, specifically social engineering. And then their other partner, Sam B. Bajra, um, says startups going back to the office, that's going to be interesting. That's going to be a uh, collaboration. And he also says standardization of open formats. And we have predictions now, or are we going going off the stock market? I can't even comment on your stock. No, no, I'm, I'm just giving I'm just giving the gloom and doom. So this is kind of <laughs> hinting on the, the 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 some of the we'll we'll get into the predictions later. But that indicates, Dave, that this that 2024 could be a reset year financially on the stock market specifically. So. I'm not I don't gonna... know. There's a, there's a flip side of that. So first of all, we should say we should do the disclaimer. Like, don't 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 invest in anything we say because we don't know what we're talking about anymore. I say the opposite. I say I say if you invest everything I say, you'll be rich. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But but we're the, the disclaimer. <laughs> we're not we're not giving. <laughs> You're not giving financial advice, but uh, there's a flip side of that, John, which says it's an election year. Interest rates are coming down. Don't bet against the Fed. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I just, I like to be in the markets. Um, and I, I mean, I feel like, I don't think this, it's very difficult to beat the S&P 500. I mean, I mean, why, why would you bother trying? I mean, Warren Buffett always said, just put your money in the S&P 500 index stock. Yeah. But, but, I, but I will tell you, I mean, Meta, take Meta. They're talking about 2 billion users. It's like every time Meta drops, like you should probably buy the stock because how do you get 2 billion users? I mean, that's like incredible. I mean, yeah. Apple, it's like you look at that Apple, chart Apple, on Apple. Apple Apple's on Apple. Great up. Incredible. But then it's probably going to hit $3 trillion valuation this year. I really like Amazon. The reason I like Amazon is because I think Amazon Web Services is going to uh, accelerate growth again this year, in part because of Gen AI. But I think IT spending is going to going to pick up a little bit, especially in this the the second half of the year. So I really like Amazon because that's going to drop right to their operating profits. And I like Google. I mean, <laughs> it's just company prints money, despite the fact that I think GCP is you know, kind of underperforming. I mean, Google still it's like the same comments on Meta. So. I mean, and and then the bank stocks. I think as interest rates drop, J.P. Morgan. I think is a winner. I think you got some good ones here, John. Yeah. Berkshire. I don't own any Berkshire. Well, I, um, probably, I wanted to give a market basket in there because it's not just the tech stocks. I mean, Apple just went straight up since 2019. Just incredible. So, but look at crazy. Nvidia. Nvidia is the craziest one. Yeah, Nvidia. Well, Nvidia is just one. I heard uh, Kramer the other day saying, and I like Jim Kramer. Jim Kramer was my first Wall Street client. When I started the IDC, you know, investment service with Alexa McClellan and, and profit actually was heavily involved. And uh, I heard him the other day saying, when stocks go hyperbolic, it's time to sell. You got to take some profit. And then, and then later on in the same segment, like basically the same breath, he's like, don't sell NVIDIA. I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> that thing went hyperbolic. So well, look at Broadcom um, stock too. So NVIDIA was a good stock this year. So that was a good one. Obviously, if you got if you got NVIDIA in anywhere after 2014, it was just incredible. So, you know, even uh, even after uh, any time after uh, October 22 and before March, I mean, the thing has just exploded. Look at Broadcom stock too. That's another good one. Yeah, Broadcom had like kind of an iffy quarter, not this past earnings, but the earnings before. And so people were selling and, and I was like, it was a buying opportunity. I, I mean, Broadcom's just got a great doubled, business. They doubled their stock price this past year, over doubled it. So, I mean, last year they came in, um, they were 500 and change, 544 in December. You know, to me, what's impressive about 
Broadcom is how they run their business. And it's going to be really interesting to see, you know, how VMware fits into that. Um, right. I mean, you know, they're going to run it as a, they, you know, Hawk Tan doesn't rely on business A to help business B. They have to be like standalone businesses. Right. So, yeah. And I think VMware is an awesome standalone business. I do think, you know, customers are, are concerned, you know, about the acquisition. They're concerned about pricing, but they don't have anywhere to go. I think I think I'd put Broadcom in my little market back at the basket here, and I'm going to do that right now for the for the graphs for the show notes. Um, but because I think it, you should, I think, I think it's, it's representative of the chip. Because I'm going to put Nvidia and Broadcom in there as well, so we'll put them in there. I mean, do you think? I mean, I, I mean, I don't mean to be gloom. I'm I'm a very positive person, right? So, but you know, uh, I think Adam Solipsky. I said this in my breaking analysis. He summed it up very well. CEO of Amazon Web Services at um, reinvent it was very he had words of wisdom i thought he goes i've seen worse times i've seen better times but i've never seen such uncertain times and i think that sums up it's very hard to predict right now is it supply is it demand what's the consumer gonna do you know inflation interest rates coming down but what about employment it's really really hard to predict what's going to happen. And so I think the key is businesses have to remain agile. I think they got to be resilient and flexible. They're going to be investing in those types of things. That's why AI is such a huge, you know, investment vector in 2024, because it's going to uh, help you be more business resilient, be more productive, be more automated. And I, but it's very hard to predict what the impacts are going to be on, on jobs and the economy. It could, it, it could have a massive wonderful impact on the economy it could have a near-term bump you know bump downward in the economy as good as it could affect jobs to me it's very very hard to predict so i think you just got to lean in and try to get ahead of the game this is one of those waves that you're going to look back and go shit why didn't we do xyz just like you did with pcs just like you did with internet i mean you we've we've been riding all the waves i know john because we're you know media and analysts so you can ride every wave but you know tech business you got to go hard on AI, no doubt about it. I'm not a skeptic there. No, it's, it's definitely the big wave, without a doubt. Uh, again, we'll see how the, the how the external market how the external market. Fl- 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 you think fl- you think Broadcom could be a trillion dollar stock? I think it could. I'm looking um, at it, it, I'm looking it, at the chart. I, I mean, it's got to. It, it depends on VMware, obviously, but they're halfway there. VMware, I think I've said in my prediction before. Um, I think VMware pulls the entire portfolio together on the software side. So, you yeah. know, as I said, when I was, uh, when I was conspiracy theory on this being called that, um, I said from <laughs> chips to software, and that was what the whole theme was at reInvent and at supercomputing, um, that from the chip to the application and that whole stack's developing and Broadcom's going to have an answer uh, for each layer of the stack from chips to the apps and the data. So again, the data piece is key. Now let's get the predictions then, because I think that was part of my point of showing the stock market was to saying, you know, can that continued trajectory of S and P and these key stocks hitting all time highs continue? Is this just a base to build on? So my thinking is there is a huge macro comment. Jen- Jonathan Hellinger and Insic Ray wrote it two points. A lot of companies are dying and are going to die. That's his quote. And then Insic said, bigger and badder cyber attacks are coming. This is huge. Dave. What do you say? Say it again. Bigger, bigger and badder cyber attacks are coming. The weak yeah. link in the modern economy isn't code or encryption, but rather the people who get tricked by bad actors by giving access to confidential systems. The new generative AI tools like ChatGPT give those bad actors a powerful new set of capabilities to manipulate the unaware and vulnerable into enabling new schemes that go well beyond the ransomware epidemic of today. Expect to see at least one major new AI-enabled cybersecurity-related incident in 2024. I think he's. Uh, I, mean, I think that's, that's like a lock. Easy. That's like a lock. One one <laughs> cyber. How about a hundred? <laughs> but I mean, so, that's not anything you know, new. I mean, AI in, in Gen AI is new, but it's not really new that we're going to see. I mean, his, it's always. I an think. Arms I think race. is. I think his point is is that outside of ransomware, which is right now everyone knows is it's the killer app for for the number one app that's profitable. The social engineering that we've been seeing that we saw at MGM and Caesar, that's going to scale. So I think, and we heard that at um, on our last SuperCloud event we had, Dave, 
that, you know, we heard that on the Dell Data Protection. So again, when last week we had our road to cyber surveillance with Dell Data Protection, um, what, uh, what's unit, uh, uh, Palo Alto Network, she said the ransomware is not the number one. It's going to be social engineering and this new cyber attack. So I think this is an accurate Wendy prediction. Whitmore. Yeah, Wendy, Wendy Whitmore. Whitmore said that. Yep, she's yeah. right on. She knows. I mean, they... Like Kevin Mandia, Wendy Whitmore, they see all the trends before, you know, they hit the mainstream media because they have the threat intelligence units, like the smartest people in the world on the grid, like watching all the trends, right. using AI. I mean, they're like really, really advanced. They work closely with governments. So, yeah, I mean, if she says it, I believe it. Well, and that's what Insects is saying. And by the way, we're, we've reported that too at the Mandian conference. We saw, and again, the MGM hack that we reported the social but, engineering is the is the new thing. So, so that automation is so coming. It's going to. But that's be... what that. But that's the, all the more reason to love like a a CrowdStrike, a Zscaler, Palo Alto Networks, even CyberArk. I mean, these are pretty good companies. You know. I, yeah. I, by the way, Insert Ray. <laughs> Remember, he was shitting on me for my Oracle comments at SuperCloud One. He's like, "Ah, oh, you lost me at Oracle. Oracle, you know, hit an all time high this year. It's pulled back a little bit, but my my." point as it relates to security mission critical highly secure i think that's the 10th time you brought that up on the pod yeah it was a little little yeah. like sensitized you, by yeah. that is, do you want to talk about it you want to talk about i do it? i kind of do <laughs> okay. yeah. go ahead dave talk about it because I, like, well, I, I, I think instant, i think he's one of the best i think he's one of the best pcs out there so you kind of he was just joke tongue-in-cheek because it's oracle no, by the way, I'm, by the way I'm, Oracle, I'm, Oracle buys I'm a lot of companies, so he he likes well, Oracle. Well, that's but, what I said too. I, you you just want to be have your companies bought. I mean, we were going back and forth. He's he's great. I love Insic Ray. But um, but I any VC, I always say, okay, what's their agenda? They've got portfolio companies. Is he holding a lot of security assets that he's trying to, you know, pump up? Uh, is he trying to jam valuations down? Like in these bad times, a lot of VCs will to try to get better deals. And you know, how much of that is like gamesmanship? And I, you know him better than I do. So, but everybody's got an agenda, you know, you and I included. <laughs> I have no agenda, Dave. No agenda. You don't have agenda? Get, just to get the content out to the users. That's my goal to get the truth and uh, do the best analysis. That's an agenda. Commentary possible. That counts. That's, that's a mission. That's their mission statement. Um, okay. All right. So get back to this, getting getting back up to the the. the, the Sorry, I to digress here. <laughs> yeah, we got, yeah. Are we making predictions here? Do I have to like put you no, put me in the spot? We're, we're reviewing predictions. Oh. So, so oh, great. we don't have to make our own. Well, how about a Bitcoin prediction? What do you think Bitcoin is going to yeah, do? Well, we, we, I mean, we can make predictions all you want, but I just want to go through other people's predictions and tell if they're good or not. I wish I knew we were going to do that. I have a stack. I'm not kidding. I have a stack of inbound predictions this big. I'd like to go grab them. I'm going to have somebody bring them to me so I can yeah, do look it. through them here. Do it in real time. So back to the office. There's a big discussion about back to the office coming back. Um, I think people have to be back at the office. And we debated this actually Um um, before and there's two schools of thought remote companies are doing some some of them are doing really well some aren't and there's a blowback on going back to the office so if you're a startup in this market again given the climate um the silicon valley scuttlebutt right now and i'm sure it's around other areas and other entrepreneurial circles is it's a tough time for entrepreneurs right now it's, it's funny you know people look at our business and say wow you guys have the cash flow business have been bootstrapped we, we're doing what's fashionable now when we started the company 13 years ago. So, you know, the uh, right now the fashion in Silicon Valley is longer runways, cash flow positive, be, um, uh, be, be very uh, strict with your cash, right? Make sure you have spending your cash in the right places and the whole SaaS metrics data are upside down. So it's a very tough economy. There's no public market window and startups are, are, in a uh, non-luxury position relative to cash spending, which means their job's 10 times harder because they don't have the cushion. Uh, again, I've always said that's always been the alpha version of entrepreneurship. Uh, and everyone always asks me, oh yeah, I just raised a huge round of funding. That's actually kind of easy. No offense, but that's kind of easy. The hardest entrepreneurial pinnacle, the Mount Everest of entrepreneurship is building a durable company without outside funding, then taking outside funding when you've already cleared the runway for either liquidity purposes or super hyper growth. GitHub did it. There's a bunch of companies that have gone down that road. Alassian was one. Um, that to me is the alpha entrepreneur. Opportunity recognition, self-financed, customer driven and scale. They still recruit the team uh, and build a durable company um, from, from scratch, from, a, from zero stage to, the, to profitability. 
the ones that are the second tier down are ones who can see an opportunity, raise the capital and go for it. And then the third is, you know, the ones who do it and fail. <laughs> and then below that, you work for a big company. Um, but but that's the startup market's hard. So a lot of people are fleeing this entrepreneurial scene unless unless they're in AI. And even some of the AI startups, Dave is saying, are, are saying they might not have a future because of the big companies like Amazon and the cloud guys um, creating their own stuff. So huge conversation around the entrepreneurial market. Again, I'm with oh. you on, on the AI opportunity. I think it's a wave that if you don't have a company, just start surfing the waves. You'll, you'll get something going because the, it's the market's the market's very bifurcated right now. I mean, there's definitely the AI haves and the AI have nots. Everybody's who who's an, a have not is AI washing. And, you know, that's going to catch up to them for sure. And the, the, the guys who have, you know, real legit AI are going to, you know, ride that wave and do, and do better. I mean, I think it's, it's very clear. I mean, and, and in budgets, you know, it's not like all of a sudden budgets are going to open up. We've been saying that AI has been stealing from everything else. And I think that's still the case. And I think that's going to continue to be the case. There's no evidence that that's changing. There is evidence in, in the survey data that, that, that uh, folks are expecting, you know, a bump up, like, you know, four or 5% in spending next year, but that's what they expected last year. I think that a lot of that's wishful thinking. They don't really know. And by the way, when you look at it, they don't expect that in Q4 and they don't expect that in Q1. So what that says to me is it's, it's wishful thinking. It's like, okay, you know, plan for, you know, X, but <laughs> be agile because we we might have to cut your budget if we got to hit earnings. And so that's the big concern people have right now is what are earnings going to do? Are, are these, are the valuations going to be supported by earnings? And if they're not, I mean, this yeah. thing markets to your earlier point and to the negative scenario, the market's priced you know, that was pretty much to perfection, at least a lot of the market is, certainly the magnificent, Magnificent Seven are. Yeah. And if there's some event, like, did you see the deep fake of the Pentagon on fire the other day? No, did I you did see not. that? No. Deep fake of Pentagon on fire. And the market reacted. The market dropped. Yeah. So you yeah. can game the market now with deep fakes. And, and, uh, 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 was there a trade behind that? Was somebody shorting the market, waiting yeah. for it to drop with a deep fake, and then you know, closing out of its short position. Absolutely. Absolutely. They were, it's going to happen. And this is going to be the guardrails are going to go up. I mean, this is, the, this is the whole prediction piece. I think the cybersecurity attacks are going to be much different than we've ever seen before. I do agree with Insic on that. The other a prediction that these guys had over at Vertex, which I like was now some deep uh, Bajra, the another partner mentioned to go back to the office. That's not, as, not as cool as the next one. He likes the standardizations of open formats, which I bring that up because you know, we reported this at Databricks event. Remember Data Plus AI and you read Snowflake Summit? Data is the fuel for generative AI boom, but but ingesting into LLMs, others can be seen a headache for users. We expect to see co industry coalescing around open standards like Apache Hudi and Apache Iceberg, with many other major players realigning their strategy accordingly. This is directly in line with the work that we're doing at the Cube Research. Um, yep. And the work Absolutely. that you're doing on specifically this thing that you're calling the sixth data platform. I don't know why you call it six, but is there a reason behind six or? Yeah, because, uh, because the, the, the big five, and this is what got Oracle a little bit triggered, I think, but the big five are the three big clouds, AWS, uh, Microsoft, and Google, uh, and then Databricks and Snowflake. And the whole concept was that they each have their own way of separating compute from storage. There's other guys who do it, but these are the five that are, really dominating the market conversation. Of course, Oracle is the king of database, so you, mm -hmm. you can't exclude them. But so the sixth data platform is not just separating compute from storage, but it's it's separating some compute from data. Because if you separate compute from storage, you can scale them independent of each other, but you're still sort of locked into that same environment. It's from the same vendor. If it's Snowflake on AWS, it's AWS compute and storage. If it's on Microsoft, it's Microsoft, you know, and Databricks. So the the future is, and when you see companies like Compute AI, they're trying to, you know, Vast has a vision to do this, and others are trying to what we say create like an Uber for all, where you can have access to any data, any any storage type. Many when you many. Say, when you say Uber for all, you mean Uber as the company? Yeah. So Uber, Uber think about Uber, the Uber, Uber as a think, company, not Uber think about as the, an adjective. No, Uber as a company. Think about the app. You're standing in a street corner, in real time. You 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 call a car. It knows you, it knows where you're going, it knows where you are, 
It you knows where the drivers are. It matches you. It knows what the price of the route is and tells you how long it's going to take. It does all this in real time. Those separate disparate data elements, they could be sitting in, like you said, an iceberg table. They could be sitting in a data in a transaction database. And by the way, they are. They're some kind of combination of Spanner and I think some Postgres and some document database, all these different formats that that, that, that Uber, back in 2015, figured out how do we create semantic coherence across all these different data types. And they had, you know, 3,000 engineers that built this amazing application to do that, again, mid-last decade. Wouldn't it be very amazing if for everybody, Uber for all, if anybody could get that capability and do people, places, and things in real time? And that's what the six data platform is really all about. Right. That's a good description. Um, that's that's a good segue into Sanjeev Mohan's trends. Um, yeah, that was a good post. He, he, that thing was amazing. He had, he did a deep dive. So Sanjeev Mohan, he's a Cube Collective member of our team. He's on his own. He's got a great his own firm, uh, Sanjo. Um, Sanjmo. Sanjmo. Sanjmo, yeah. Sanjmo. I was spelled wrong. Um, like former Sarbeet. gardener analyst, <laughs> Sarbjeet. He, um he those guys are great and so but what's interesting about x gardner he's he's like one of the best analysts in data so he's solid um what's interesting he has what's he had rising trends stable and declining mm. what's declining in his mind is the modern data stack the promise yeah, so of a decentralized approach to moving data um from it to business uh didn't ever got off the ground he also is that a typo because he's got the same words under data mesh right i, I think he just copy pasted i, yeah, I wonder so if that's I, what I, th he... I think he means data mesh because they're both kind of the same thing but both were under the same umbrella once infrastructure one was more control plane but he's basically saying data mesh is passe dave we're kind of declining well, i want to know your thoughts on that but well. i mean i think i i put a, i posted on his linkedin i said you know it makes me sad that you say it's declining but i mean i i get his point is that the concepts that jamak Dagani, who was on the cube at supercloud was she's amazing the concept that she put forth they 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 never really talked about specific implementation and technologies they avoided doing that and but she's spun out and started her own company to do just that uh, it's going to take some time. I always saw data mesh as an organizational construct, decentralizing, you know, data management and giving access to business people. I think that, I think it, it, in concept, that trend will continue, but it's not a technology that you can go out and buy. And so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you go into perplexity and say, is data mesh rising or falling? And it'll tell you it's rising. So I, I don't know. He's he's right from I think a technology standpoint. But I think I, I think I would trust Sanjeev over perplexity app because yeah, but sure. Them. But 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 so so for instance, data fabric and data mesh are oftentimes sort of confused. And I think I would say that data fabric is gaining in in popularity. And I think that's an infrastructure enabler for data mesh. And the modern data stack is, 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 again, separating compute from storage. It's cloud native. It's software as a service. It's a consumption model. I wouldn't say that's declining per se. I, I would say it's 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 hitting its peak. Let me put it that way. Uh, I think it's it's it was on the steep part of the S curve, and I think that part that part of the S curve is flattening. So the interesting thing is going to be how do Databricks and Snowflake jump S curves. We know that Snowflake is doing it through things like data sharing, uh, through the uh, the container services, through the, it's basically its app store, if you will, app store for data. You know, that's their their big move. Databricks sort of breaking away from, you know, Microsoft, which helped them with their steep ascendancy. And so, mm -hmm. and then you got the big three cloud guys. How, uh, for instance, how does AWS bring together all its multiple data stores and its data platforms and all the different meta metadata, you know, locations and stores that it has. How does it unify its metadata? That's, I think, really what he's talking about is the momentum that we saw in the last five years for that so-called modern data stack is starting to peak. And I would agree with him. And I think it's moving toward the intelligent data platform. Now, all these modern data stack guys are going to move to intelligent data platforms. They're already, you know, headed in that direction. So, but I love this, this chart. It's called top data and AI trends for 2024, rising, stable, and declining. And the rising is intelligent data platforms, AI agents, personalized AI stack, and he's right on AI governance. So he's, he's nailing it. And then stable, he's got data products, metadata plane, cross cloud, unified data plane, and then declining modern data stack and data mesh. 
and he defines each I, one. I guess he super, a cross cloud is super cloud, basically. Yeah, absolutely. So he defines each one, or at least goes into it in a really great detail. And this thing is a tome. How many words is this? It's like bigger than a breaking analysis. He's got you know nice block diagrams and architectures. It's really well thought out. And so <laughs> I guess I I would agree with you. I trust him more than perplexity. I just I love Jamak Dagani. I think she's brilliant, and I hope she does really really well with her startup. Well, what's interesting about it, what's, it, it's a lot, a lot to digest. We'll try to get the, um, the a link to the graph on, on the show notes. But the point of this is to take away, if you're watching and listening, the rising is the intelligent data platforms. It's, it's funny how the modern data stack's declining. The word modern is the, is the relative word. I think that's not declining. I think it's the specific old way they did it. But what's rising is the data platforms, data, this intelligent data platform. That's key. That's what we've been doing a lot of work around. So you look at our content, you'll see us covering all the companies that are essentially making that. Again, the AI agents, I was skeptical on this, but after seeing the demos from the SaaS conference we went to, to uh, reInvent, the applications are going to be agent and personalized. So to me, uh, and he mentions, and he goes, and he gets into this personalized AI stack. The, the, there's another debate going on around the notion of the word stack. Because AI is not a stack, it's a graph. <laughs> and so, so the question is, is that can you even call it a, a tech stack? Okay, but those two concepts of AI agents and personalized stack, personalized AI, huge, huge. That's the app. That's the killer app, in my opinion, of, the, of 2024. The emergence of the killer app in AI. And it's going to be personalized and agent-driven, meaning augmenting human intelligence. Okay, not AGI, augmenting human intelligence, A H I. Okay, and that's going to be enabled by the companies and startups and and, and engineers and, and entrepreneurs that build the intelligent data platforms and solve the governance problem. So I think he's nailed the rising, and I think he actually hits a home run on this because he hits the two critical things that have to enable the killer app. Because without governance being built in from day one, rethinking that, you're screwed because you can't actually scale the AI. You'll always have solution. You'll have deficiencies. So, uh, and and the so, other prediction I'm going to make is is that LLMs are going to be refactored in a way that people aren't seeing them. Two reasons: security. Insec Ray brought up the AI piece before. He kind of teased out LLMs, but you're going to see a lot of people protecting their LLMs more. And then LLM integration with other models, right? So the power law that we put out last year, 2023, that'll continue to happen. And the emergence of some alchemy between LLM models. So integrations, the fusion, the interaction of data. That will enable new use cases. It's a good word, alchemy. And he's got it. And, you can't, and, you, and you, can't, you can't do that, by the way, if you have old legacy data management. Okay. So, so here's the thing. So when I think of modern data stack, I think of, again, separating compute from storage and cloud native and SAS and all, everything we talked about before. And I think of Snowflake and Databricks. When you look at his diagram, that says figure two components of an intelligent data platform. You build it from bottom up as GPU, CPU, and then on top of that cloud platform, and then you got unified storage. And then above that, you've got this multi-engine orchestrator, which is the semantic layer, the vector indexing. You got other analytic engines. And above that, you got APIs and an SDK to support uh, data prep and, and AI governance. And above that, you got agents and co-pilots that are going to be taking action for you, systems of agency. And then data products come out of that. So if I'm Snowflake, I'm saying, well, this is exactly what we're doing. This is This is what we're building on top of our you know, our, our clean rooms and our governed architecture and Databricks is saying the same thing. And so what I think is that those modern data platforms, they're, they're going to be challenged, but I think they've, they're well on their way of migrating to that, in these intelligent data platforms. I do think what's going to happen is the guys who really didn't hit escape velocity, uh, that, you know, got a lot of money from VCs to separate compute from storage and go to the cloud, you know, they're going to get bought or they're going to, you know, they, you know, companies tend, uh, I guess they do die sometimes, but they tend to get, you know, bought up or accu hired. And I think that's what's going to happen to many of them uh, that didn't get through the knot hole. And I'm, I'm dying to see Databricks go public. I can't wait to see their numbers. <laughs> exactly. What is that? What are they hiding behind the curtain? 
you know, what do you think? I mean, I don't blame them. What do you I think? Don't, what do you think they're hiding behind the curtain? No, I don't think they're hiding. I think they're just. A, well, I mean, they're, they're private. The, no, I think. Private. If you, but I, if you, I think I, you, I don't mean you, hiding, but they're private. Yeah, but it, right. But if you look at the IPOs in 2023, it was a really shitty time to do an IPO. And I was think I think they said we don't have to do an IPO. Why would we do an IPO now? And, and yeah, they can raise money in the private market. market. Right. And the, doing, the old, the old well. days, you went public to raise money. Now it's just like you don't have to. They can just do you raise remember? Um, you, I know you remember well because you know these guys better than I do. But Cloudera, how they basically Mike Olson's rap was well, we don't need to raise money. They raised a, a boatload of money from from Intel. And so they they said we don't need to go public. I, I meant to say not raise money. They raised money on private markets, and they held off doing their IPO. Um, there was a time when being a public company, you remember, in that time frame was just coming out of the downturn. was It was a horrible time to be a public company, and yeah. and so I think I don't know. I, I think there was why why would Databricks rush to go public? Look what happened to UiPath. UiPath had a thirty eight billion dollar valuation before it went public it's like last round that you know all the late late investors got into 38 billion dollar valuation i think they're probably you know trading at 11 billion today 12 billion maybe and so you know when you see companies touting their valuation i mean i get why like vast was excited nine billion dollar valuation and there were only a couple of other companies like anthropic and open ai who were able to sort of sustain higher valuations that were in the ai space but, you know, you don't want to be the next UI path from that standpoint. Um, I mean, they still made a lot of money and their founders did great. But, you know, the late stage investors, they got they 14 billion now. So they got a ways to go before those Series F investors get get their money back. You know, so you don't want to be that. And I like UI path. It's just it got too hot too fast. So and that's the, the risk of some of these AI, you know, these new emerging AI unicorn pluses. So. Yeah, a lot of M&A going on in terms of uh, companies. Cisco just bought a company, uh, Isovalent, which is a um, company we interviewed. Um, it's like Tom Gillis did that deal. Uh, what do you make of that? What do you, what do you make of that? was a security deal, right? No, networking deal. It was basically, they were doing uh, cloud native for networking. They did, the, they did a lot of the kernel stuff for uh, Kubernetes. Basically, um, they were the Kubernetes networking company, so cloud native. So Cisco bought them up. Um, and then you know, Scott Rainovich has got a good post uh, on this. And, he's a uh, good guy. I saw him. I, don't know if, I saw him somewhere. It must have been a reinvent. He's a smart dude. We it, we tried to work with him for a while. We just kind of he's out in Montana, so we don't see him that much. But he's he does good work. He's got a um. He's his his name of the site's called Futurum. F what is it called? Futurum. Futurum. F U T U R I O M. Futurium? Futurium, yeah. Futurium. It's like there's, there's it's, it's, it's like, like Futurum. Like yeah. Futurum, yeah. So, yeah, you know, that he yeah, I think he was like, when I said yeah, that sounds like those guys, he's like, Don't ever say I'm so mad at that name. Um, so he had a little thing. But anyway, the the uh, Berkeley packet filter EBPF was the uh, uh, thing that was part of the Cilium, which is an open source project that this company did. Pretty deep tech chops, guys from Google, OpenStack community. We've known them for years. Uh, very geeky company that Cisco bought. So again, good for Cisco getting back in the action. Alteryx going private in the news. That's another big story. Um, and again, mentioned that you know um, the uh, Anthropics trying to raise seven hundred fifty million on a fifteen billion dollar valuation. Seven hundred fifty million. But did, so, I thought I, you know I saw that. I thought and I wrote this in a breaking analysis last week when I did my Open AI, my uh, David versus Goliath. I thought Anthropic at one point had a twenty billion dollar valuation. No, so I no. think so. Well, it's interesting. I, you know, I remember they have, remember remember they have a lot of uh, incestuous activity with other clouds, right? So remember, Amazon's got a deal. Adam Slutsky, you know, quoted on the Cube saying that you know they can invest up to four billion in Anthropic. So I wonder if they're in the round. In this, and they're, what they're saying in the reports, claiming that Menlo Ventures in this deal. So. um it's going to be very interesting to see how this all plays out. So, so this is a post from October. Anthropic got money from um, Sam Bankman-Fried too back in the day in 2022. So look at this. Google Listen put to this. 300 so, million in, so and then prominent Chat GPT rival eyes 30 billion dollar valuation with big new big tech investments. This is in October. This is on the street. 
startupbehindgpt.com. Anthropic, the startup behind GPT competitor, uh, chat GPT competitor with its Claude, is looking to raise an additional $2 billion in funding, according to the information. Google, which acquired 10% stake in the startup, is expected to make additional funding around the startup, looks to expand its resources and pool investors. The company is seeking a valuation of between 20 and $30 billion. And then now it's, it, we're saying 15 billion, right? So why that's, would that's they have- the, that's, a, that's the valuation. That's what I'm talking about. The latest valuation number I read on the Silicon Angle was 15 billion. Well, I mean, if, uh, Dick, it's again, this is where it gets weird, the, all this fuzzy math going on. So Google had put a commitment up to 2 billion from Google. Um, right. Amazon committed up to 4 billion. They raised $100 million from South Korean telecommunications company, SK Telecom. Um, Sapphire Vich has committed to more than a billion. And then their last priced round, again, we don't know what these rounds are, Dave. Remember we were speculating that yeah, it could course. be in-kind from Amazon because of all the work they're doing over there? Their last round was a Series C, $450 million, led by Spark Capital that included Zoom, Salesforce, Microsoft, HOF Capital, Menlo Ventures, Sound Ventures, Pioneer Fund, Wilkos, SV Angel, so Alphabet. So that's it's May, all over the place. May of, 20, seeing... May of 2023. Now, the, the, we reported on Silicon Angle that $300 million from Google was on a $4 billion valuation in March of this year. $4 billion. So Silicon Angle, we break the whole post out. Uh, all of the trending has it says it, it says in May they were valued at five billion, and then I uh, last week from my breaking analysis I had them at twenty billion. I'm seeing fifteen billion. I'm seeing eighteen point four billion, and the information has a report saying that it's between twenty and thirty billion. And Silicon uh, Angle had it at also at fifteen billion. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Although this is Silicon Angle, although a valuation of 15 billion is being discussed, the final valuation of the deal could go above 18 billion. I think it's going to be north of 20 billion. I really think so. I think the research I did two, last week and a half ago had them at 20 billion. Well, it says 15 so, billion on our on, on this report from Bloomberg. I know. So, and 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 I saw that too. And that's why I, I was like, wait a minute. And now the latest is it could be 20 to 30 billion. But anyway. Yeah. There it is. Um, All over the place. But so, but you saw that, you saw the, I mean, there's the Gen AI haves and the Gen AI haves not, have nots. Like Jasper's getting crushed. Hey, you got it right here. Last week's breaking analysis. Hugging face, 5 billion on 823. They're obviously doing well. Databricks is really not Gen AI, but it's ML and AI. It's 43 billion. Open AI, 86 billion. Anthropic, I had a 20 billion as of 1023. I'll have to dig out that report. Go here, three billion as of last August. Jasper was one point five billion, and now it's down. In in September, it was down to one point two billion because it's getting you know disrupted by ChatGPT. Data Robot was six billion. There's no way Data Robot's six billion dollar value. That was seven twenty one, July of twenty twenty one. It's it's probably less than half of that now. Right. I mean, I think it's interesting time, Dave. I mean, look at the world of private equity. Um, one of the big um, challenges right now is is that the capital markets on the entrepreneurial side are are tight. The big, the bigger, bigger getting bigger, like Anthropic, and then private equity is sideways because they bet all those late stage and trying to do startup deals. So, so you have a um, uh, a weird world in private equity. Uh, M and A activity should be hot in twenty twenty four. Again, there's gonna be a lot of roll ups. You're starting to see people do that. Again, if you're on the wrong side of a roll-up, if you're a company and you're buying distressed assets, let's just say that you're a company, you're buying all this distressed assets. You're buying shit assets to begin with. Then you got to make them work. If you don't have the cash position and then you can't generate revenue to support the free cash flow, you got to go to the capital markets. And the capital markets right now are very tight. So if you're going to do M&A, you better have um, the right formula. Otherwise, I think it's cultural too, right? If, you, if you're buying you know, a bunch of distressed assets... You know, are you are you going to be able to keep the people? Or are they going to you know fit in? I mean, that's that's always a hard thing. But John, look at the delta between OpenAI's valuation, eighty six billion, and they almost fucked that up with this firing Sam Altman knuckleheads. But and then it, let's call it Anthropic is the next closest. Let's call it twenty billion. You know, give me the benefit of the doubt on that research. And they, people now saying thirty. But look at the delta between that OpenAI and that. You remember. Last January, you, Sarbjeet, and I and in, in, in the Palo Alto studio did a breaking analysis around, uh, you know, the title was OpenAI won't be able to 
maintain its first mover advantage. And you disagreed with that at the time. <laughs> you, was, you were saying, yeah, they will. I mean, it looks like you, what like, did, so far, it looks like What did right. I say? Yeah, you said they'll be able to maintain. They'll have a first mover advantage was yes. your argument. And Sarbjeet right. and I were taking the the counterpoint, saying that other guys will catch up. Google is going to get great AI. They're going to be a bunch of VCs. But open AI is like there's a huge gap. No, the in, question, in, the, 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 the context, first of all, I was right, and I'm still right, but I it's evolving answer. And at that time, I said the context of that question we were debating was, is there one rule? We, we were kind of debating, is there going to be winner take most, maybe a handful of models or one model to rule the world. I was saying, no, there won't be one model to rule the world. There'll be an open source. And that's how we got to the long tail. That conversation was the impetus of us publishing that pioneering research around the power law for, for AI. Because at that time we were saying, you, the market's not just at chat GPT. The question was, is chat GPT have, have switching costs? Is it sustainable? That was that was the our discussion. I was saying they have, they're going to have a first mover advantage and will maintain that for some time, uh, if not for a long time. Again, I did even say at that time the Netscape right. moment, and, which and, ended up becoming an issue when Altman had his problem right with the board. But, so, but that's what we were saying. We were saying it's going to be just like a net Netscape moment, and we were arguing with you that they were going to not be able to maintain that first move advantage. It's still early days, but. Not yeah. only does their value does their valuation show a big gap, but if you look at the spending data and the momentum and the sentiment, they are far ahead of anybody. They blew through Databricks, which is extremely successful. When you look at the private company sentiment in the ETR data, nobody's even close. They're like up and to the right. And then you got this pack of people. Databricks is in there again. They're not Gen AI, but the Gen AI guys which really hugging face is not gen AI. It's really, you know, a, like a market, right? So, but, but Anthropic, Cohere, Snorkel, Character AI, you know, and there's many, many others. They're not even close in terms of the market sentiment. I mean, I mean, open AI is kicking ass and we see it. We use open AI yeah. with the cube AI. It's, it's dirt cheap. It's, it's better than Llama 2. It's better than these other models. And I keep saying, I, I'm, I'm dying to get to bedrock. I know that the guys are playing around with it. I haven't seen a lot of results yet. But Yeah, I mean, it's a, 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 open AI is keeping them in. The gap's closing, though. It's not, I mean, open AI is easy to work with. It's going to, it's back down to the uh, the power law at the, at the bit, from a big language model standpoint, open AI is number one. And, um, and ChatGPT is the application. Anthropic with Claude, number two. Llama probably pushing up there with number two hard because it got uptake with the developers and that was a genius move by meta because to your prediction dave meta metaverse was a miss gen ai is the home run and that look at the stock price with that meta sense they should have changed their name to ai not meta <laughs> yeah so, so. <laughs> or meta ai <laughs> <laughs> maybe they will facebook <laughs> this, you know, meta ai um, i'm just I, i'm know. looking for evidence that along that i mean i love the the, the long tail and the power law of gen AI. I'm looking for evidence that there's stuff happening on prem. I, honestly, I don't see it yet. I don't see it yet. Even though uh, we predicted it, it's going to take some time and I do think it's going to happen, well, but it's not, uh, we're it's not, not gonna, we're, we're not going to have time to get to it, but you know, and we can maybe do a quasi rant and this, but the cloud re repatriation done right by um, the base camp CTO co-founder. He posted another LinkedIn post this time, giving an update on stats um, so three days ago, he he gave some stats. They're saving millions of dollars. He says, "quote um, They bought four thousand CPUs, six thousand Dell machines. No, six hundred thousand worth of Dell." They said they're saving right here. Um, bring it now because their use case. They said they they, over, they said they overpaid for Amazon. They don't need that. The, the provisioning is great, but they're, they're, for their use case, they want it on prem and they save more money. It's not worth the premium. So. Um, Patrick Thornhill shared this with me. Um, they they said conservatively they'll save seven million. Let's see what he says here. Already in September, we've secured a million dollars in savings on the cloud bill. Okay, so um, and as the reserved instances were as as and as the reserved instances started to expire, the bill kept collapsing. So they bought all the reserved instances. They did all that stuff on there, but they said. Since they've deployed, okay, they're up and running with over a million and the savings are coming in. Well, 
That's three where three point two million dollar cloud budget for twenty twenty two, and they're saving money. That's where. Okay, so what does that mean for, for top of the the pod here? What does that mean for the market? And Is that a good thing? They're six months right? into if their gonna, they're, they're gonna, six if, months into their exit off the cloud. So isn't that a good thing for the for the for the market? Um, yes, if you're going to be able to use AI to drive that kind of you know productivity and it's, I don't it, know. I mean, here's why this is why the repatriations this kind of use case that's interesting. I think the net new use cases are going to be higher on premises. And I've said that in, in before. I'll say it again. I'll stick to that um, position. But when you have a premium in the cloud now, the value is going to shift because Amazon's value proposition is, is that we'll help you with the undifferentiated heavy lifting. What this guy is basically saying is, is that that's not heavy lifting for me anymore. I'll make more money by hosting my app on premise and multiple geo geos because their app doesn't need uh, um, more provisioning. Their, their use case of provisioning on the cloud is over. The higher level services, they weren't getting value out of those high level services for the premium that they were paying. That's his premise. Okay, so I get it. However, Amazon has other things that are heavy lifting for companies. Exactly. <laughs> so, exactly. So. Exactly. So I mean, so look, right, like like contact centers, um, like what they're doing in, in telco, um, what they're doing in CDNs. Um, yeah, so the value shifts. So. It's just a, it's a shifting of the curve. So he, even though it's all rah-rah, people getting their, their – their, um, they're getting uh, all, all wrapped around this, it's just good business because – Amazon's essentially taught everyone how to do this. And you got Kubernetes, you got you know, it's it's all cloud native now, so they can operate best of breed, open source, cluster management, great hardware from Dell, for instance. They have their um, good storage. They architect their own stuff, build their own gears, swap out broken stuff, a little SRE action, little um, little little DevOps on on premise, no problem. Yeah, but it's a bit, okay? but look at but they don't have a, they don't have a need for uh, the cloud scale. Right, but it, right. If you need scale, right, and you and you and you don't want to like load a storage array onto your loading dock, then then you're going to be doing still doing cloud. It's not like repatriation. I mean, the repatriation talk is still, you know, anybody who says repatriation is going to start eating into cloud. I just I don't buy that at all. Yeah. I, now, the, the interesting thing is, so Jassy uses this this this, this metric that only ten percent. Everybody repeats it. Only ten percent of IT is in the cloud. Now that's true. I think it's factually correct that of the four trillion in IT, probably you know only ten percent of that four hundred billion is in in the public cloud, the big three or four. The question is, how does an Amazon go after that? Because they're really an infrastructure player, and if you if you narrow the market into infrastructure, you know they, the lot more of the the spending is in the cloud. And I would say. 30 to 40% of the workloads are in the cloud and that's going to continue to grow for sure. But so that begs the question is, okay, how does Amazon expand its TAM? Do they already have, you know, the strategy to do that by going after things like contact center and new, you know, industry transformation and telco and, you know, applying LLMs for the industry. I, I would have liked to heard more of that at, at reInvent. So, so is the market already so huge for their existing platform or do they have to, you know, really affect a, a, a TAM expansion strategy, yeah. whether it's going up market with software or into, I think industry transformation is more likely identifying other heavy lifts that they can simplify where, you know, the industries just need, need streamlining. Well, so it's a huge market. I mean, either as, way, as, no we're, lack of time. We're winding down on the pod time here, but I, one last story just popped across my phone here. Breaking news: Apple explores AI deals with news publishers. The company has discussed multi-year deals with worth at least fifty million to train its generative AI systems on publishers' news articles. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. No, I I must have got the memo. Oh, so you know. What does that mean? So rich get richer. Apple's going to use their AI. And we saw an article where um, Business Insider's owner, Alex Springer, cut a deal with OpenAI to get in their index. Here it is. Google News, Dave. It's coming. You know, AI. So you know, the work we're doing with Cube AI is right in line with this. This is great for us. So, um, but it might hurt journalism. 
again, the question, I'm very skeptical on these big platforms with journalism. The, 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 it has not ended well for journalism companies to bet the ranch on the big tech platforms. Twitter screwed everybody over. Uh, Facebook never delivered any revenue. I don't even know what Apple does for revenue. It's just tiny mouse nuts and, and, and no user closed loop. They're, they're sucking in the, the entire estate into their apps. I, I so, do think, <clears throat> having said that, I mean, I, I do think there's always going to be a market for good journalism and good analysis, like real analysts and real journalists. I think the problem for the journalist is like, it's hard to make money. I mean, I know, you know, our, 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 our friend, my really good friend, and you know, him, Charlie Sennett. I mean, I think what he does and people like him are really unique. You know, bloggers don't do that. I mean, some, he's a nonprofit may. though. He's a nonprofit. Yeah, no, no, I know. I know. I'm just saying that type of, you know, they just got a nose for the story. You know, I know, big dig it, cost overrun. You it, know, I know I mean, but they, it might be yeah. said though that the the journals has to be a nonprofit. You got it's a nonprofit entities now that are, that are. It's just anyway. We'll pick that up later, uh, yeah. Dave. It's uh, end of the year. I want to just say thank you to everyone who's listening to the pod. We appreciate the, all the feedback. Go to SiliconAngle.com, and also, uh, Dave, congratulations to you on your breaking analysis podcast, which got thank you almost a million downloads this year. Um, congratulations, not quite, but yeah, thank you. Seven, it's three quarters of a million. There. Yeah, uh, great franchise, great brand. You want to expand on that on the research side, and the Cube research team is growing and expanding. Um, we can see a lot more new things coming out of the Cube. Uh, it's good. We're going to see a lot of exciting 2024 for us and our pod. We're going to mix things up. We're 41 episodes in, and uh, we're going to do a review, a look back on what worked, what didn't work. As we said, we're going to iterate this podcast, keep uh, changing it. So again, keep DMing us and emailing us on what you think we should do or not do to make this podcast better, better insights, better experience. You want more entertainment. I had someone this week tell me uh, that they wanted more entertainment dave they th they think uh, you're funny um they think i'm funny <laughs> no i'm only kidding i'm only saying that <laughs> okay they want us come they want you're comment. the life of the party <laughs> okay they okay want... i think it's i think it's fun when we argue and people get uh, to see us like going at each other in a friendly way no i think <laughs> i think there was a section we should do a uh a, 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 a meme section uh anyway I, we'll we'll get to that uh, next time but uh, have right. a great oh, christmas. hey merry christmas john merry christmas all happy the best holidays, everyone out there and uh, see you next time happy holidays see you